thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft-times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas, in fairy lands forlorn. In these lines, composed in a single morning during a period of great poetic creativity, Keats not only contrasts his own frail and mortal voice with the melodic and eternal one of the nightingale, but also recognises that while for most immortality is nothing more than mere fantasy, it is something quite possible for the artist and the poet to achieve. Eighteen nineteen was Keats' most creative year. At Wentworth House, now known as Keats House in Hampstead, as well as writing the just quoted Ode to a Nightingale, he also produced Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode on Melancholy, Hyperion, and Lamia. These are works which attest to his newfound poetic maturity following others which Keats himself described as mere attempts. The poems of 1817 and Endymion of 1818, which were savaged by critics and which failed to bring literary glory to their author. However, in February 1820, Returning from London on the outside of a coach to save money, Keats developed the first signs of tuberculosis, a terrible disease that had already killed his brother Tom two years earlier. Keats was initially plagued by doubts as to what to do. In a letter of the 16th of August, in reply to Shelley, who had invited him to Pisa, he writes that, there is no doubt that an English winter would put an end to me and do so in a lingering, hateful manner. And therefore I must either voyage or journey to Italy as a soldier marches up to a battery. However, his continually declining state of health decided the matter for him. Keats set sail from London on the 18th of September, 1820, heading for Naples. In his company was Joseph Seven, a portrait and miniature painter, whom he'd met in London in 1816, but who was at that time more a casual acquaintance than a close friend. Seven did not abandon him, and together they finished the journey, arriving in Rome on the 15th of November. They took up lodging at 26 Piazza di Spagna, which owes its name to the Spanish Embassy to the Holy See. A few metres from this building are the houses in which Lord Byron stayed in 1817 and Percy B. Shelley in 1819. This was not only an area for foreigners, but the true pulsing heart of a city, which in that period had a population of 135,000 and which was concentrated in an area to the south of the Capitoline Hill, on the west side of the Tiber, and to the east of the Quirinal Hill. Beyond this relatively small, relatively civilised centre, were vast areas infested by bandits. In this microcosm of the diversity of humanity, of high dignitaries and simple merchants, of artists and beggars, of crooks and musicians, the acquaintance between Keats and Seven blossomed fully into friendship. Keats encouraged Seven to visit sites of major historical interest, and Seven played Haydn symphonies on the piano which he had rented, and he cooked meals in the little fireplace for his friend, who was growing weaker and weaker. 
Through the window came the sounds of everyday life, the voices of people meeting on the Spanish steps, the splashing of water from the nearby Bacaccia fountain. Carriages being cleaned and repaired thanks to the skilled efforts of the workmen on the nearby Via della Carrozza. But Keats continued to grow weaker. He asked Seven to go to the non-Catholic cemetery, which is near the city's Aurelian walls and which is overlooked by the ancient Roman pyramid of Caio Cestius, and was happy when his friend told him about the many violets, his favourite flowers, that grew over the graves. To cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. He was buried in the non-Catholic cemetery, aged 25, and 56 years later, standing by his grave, Oscar Wilde wrote that this was the holiest place in Rome. The news of Keats' death reached Byron and Shelley, who were both in Italy at the time. Shelley, who was staying in Tuscany with his second wife Mary, author of the famous novel Frankenstein, was experiencing an intense period of creativity. During a stay in Rome, he had written the first three acts of his lyrical drama Prometheus Unbound, which was completed by a fourth act written during a brief stay in Florence. This is widely considered to be the peak of his achievement in poetry. Shelley saw Prometheus's victory as emblematic of man's liberation from the ideological chains which he himself had forged and with which he had enchained himself. They are comparable to the social conventions of the time, but also to the tyrannical regimes that Shelley had fought against from a young age. The poet felt that the sublime union between man and the spirit of nature was the only way to escape from an eternity of oppression and slavery. The only way to conceive of a more spiritual, liberated humanity. He believed that the natural tension between man and the divine was not played out through existing conventional religions, but through mysticism and introspection and through man's identification with nature. A nature that was capable of showing the spectator beauty and horror, peace and violence, tranquility and destruction. Keats's death inspired Shelley to write Adonais, an impassioned elegy, whose verses considered the transiency of empires and religions. Rome, in Shelley's poetry, is the living testimony of a decadence that could never prevail over the eternity of nature. A defense of poetry also dates from this period. In this essay, Shelley explores the complexity, indeed the impossibility, of concretely defining the genre, and at the same time knowing that, as he writes, we live among such philosophers and poets as surpass beyond comparison any who have appeared since the last national struggle for civil and religious liberty. Shelley continued to write at a rapid pace, almost obsessively, as if he also knew that his own death was approaching. In 1822, when returning from a trip to Livorno by boat, he drowned during a ferocious storm, along with his friend Edward Williams. On his desk, his poem, The Triumph of Life, remained unfinished. Cremated on the beach where his body had been recovered, while a dismayed Byron looked on, his ashes now rest in the non-Catholic cemetery in Rome, where Keats too is buried.
Lord Byron, who was the closest to the ideals of social change and revolution of the first generation of romantic writers, had been in Italy for five years, having left England and the harsh criticisms that the press, which was influenced by the puritanical and pious attitudes of the early 1800s, had hurled at him. Unlike Keats and Shelley, who in their poetry explore the natural expression and produce the natural result of a process of introspection, for Byron, it is action that dominates. The surprise of an unexpected gesture, which breaks with logic and abandons conventionality. Don Juan is a prime example of this. Begun in 1818, the epic poem is a brutally honest satire on European politics and culture in the opening years of the 19th century. At Pisa, together with his friend Lee Hunt, who had arrived from England, and Shelley, who would not live to see its publication, Byron was occupied in producing the journal The Liberal, of which only four issues were ever published. The reactions of the English press were brutal. Byron was convinced that the criticisms were directed at him rather than at the journal, and so turned his back on the world that had spurned him. In 1823, he set sail for Greece, seduced as he was by the fight for independence. He spent the final months of his life in poetic hiatus. His brief poem, on this day I complete my 36th year. One of his very few compositions from this period demonstrates the poet's sense of desperation. Tis time the heart should be unmoved, since others it hath ceased to move. Yet, though I cannot be beloved, still let me love. My days are in the yellow leaf, the flowers and fruits of love are gone. Tread those reviving passions down, unworthy manhood. Unto thee, indifferent should the smile or frown of beauty be. If thou regret thy youth, why live? Then look around and choose thy ground, and take thy rest. After riding for miles in the pouring rain, Byron came down with a rheumatic fever and died on the 19th of April, 1824, having settled in the land he felt at home in. It is said that his last words were, Now I shall go to sleep. Byron's work, which reflects his thoughts, feelings and state of mind, could have been forgotten, but the sheer intensity of the poet's work has saved it from obscurity and delivered it to posterity, just as Keats immortalised the poet's words in Ode to a Nightingale. In 1903, a group of men assembled in Rome. Among them were Robert Underwood Johnson, an American poet and journalist, as well as the future American ambassador in Rome, Sir Renal Rod, the future British ambassador in Italy, and Harry Nelson Gay, a Harvard-educated scholar and prolific writer on Italian history. Their objective was ambitious. They wished to create a place that would testify to the importance of the English Romantics, a place where the passions of a bygone era could be revived and live on. The gestation period of the project went on for more than six years until the 3rd of April 1909, when the Keats Shelley Huss was born. Messages of congratulation and good wishes came from around the world. From the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, who had followed the progress of the project from 1906, and also from King Edward VII, who was highly enthusiastic about the initiative. Today, the Keats Shelley House still exists and still seeks to keep the words and ideas of that generation of poets alive and relevant to new generations. Keats had a strong belief in the value of direct experience. 
He once wrote that axioms in philosophy only become axioms when they have been proven by experience. From a poetic point of view, we read beautiful things, but perhaps we can appreciate them even more fully through our own personal experiences. And in the piazza, the splashing of water gets quieter and quieter. The movement of people on the Spanish steps becomes more and more rapid, chaotic, hectic. The sound of the carriages is too soft to hear the arresting noise of their wheels on the pavement. Perhaps a wider view is necessary to show what Shelley understood. Go thou to Rome, at once the paradise, the grave, the city and the wilderness. <laughs> 